please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter one. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. First I want to read another passage and that's in John chapter three. So keep your finger in Ephesians and I want to read a passage out of the Gospel of John chapter three, beginning in verse three. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You know, Christians are different from other people in many ways, but they're different from other people when it comes to birthdays. Why well, I read out of John, John is talking about being born again, you know, your birthday. Because as Christians, we have two such occasions to celebrate. One is our physical birth, when we, you know, we receive well wishes and gifts to commemorate the happy day that we came into existence and we began our physical life, right? We've all been two birthdays, we've all had our own birthday, wonderful time, wonderful celebration. But as Christians, we have another birthday. The other birthday is when we are, as John says, as I read previously, when we are born again of the water and the Spirit. And that I call our spiritual birthday. So we have our physical birthday when we come from our mothers, come into this world as physical beings, that's our physical birthday. And then we have our spiritual birthday when we come out of the waters of baptism, new creatures in Jesus Christ. Now the second birthday, as I said, takes place on the day of our baptism when we become Christians and experience the second birth and entry into the spiritual life with Christ. Now, as you probably can tell, there's a difference between these two birthdays. On our physical birthday, we receive gifts that change from year to year. You know, yesterday it was at one of my grandson's birthday, Daxton, and he was five, and so he got all kinds of cool Batman stuff. Batman underwear, Batman socks, Batman t-shirts, Batman ball, you name it. He's got you know, the complete Batman um, inventory, if you wish, because he's five. Of course, uh, when he gets a little older, when he'll be 15, He'll probably want a bike or he'll want a phone or some other gadget. You know, I don't think he'll be interested in Batman anymore. And that's the way it works, isn't it? We, uh, we change. The gifts that we get, they're different as we grow older. We have different tastes, different needs, and these, you know, the stuff that we get wears out, so we need to replace uh, a tie or a, you know, whatever, uh, a phone or other gadget, because these things wear out. However, on, our, um, on the day of our second or our spiritual birth, we also receive gifts, but we receive spiritual gifts that we get to keep and enjoy forever and we never change them. So on our physical birthdays, we get different gifts you know, from year to year. But on our spiritual birthday, we receive a set of gifts that we always keep, that never wear out that are new and enjoyable to us all the days of our lives. So this evening, I'd like to describe for you the seven gifts that we receive on our spiritual birthday. And that's why I asked you to open Ephesians to Ephesians chapter one, verse, uh, beginning in verse three, because there Paul the apostle explains that God blesses his children with gifts. And in verses four to 14, he describes seven spiritual birthday gifts. The first gift that he talks about is purity. Verse uh, four, he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. First gift, purity. You know, I believe that one of the reasons that God chose baptism as the response of faith was that water has always represented cleansing and, and purity. When we are born again, God purifies us. As Paul says, He makes us holy 
and blameless. This is a wonderful gift because it means we can come into God's presence without feeling ashamed. You know, you're wondering, where's the gift? Where's the thing? You know, if I get $200 as a gift, I know the value of that gift. I've got purchasing power for 200 bucks. I can go in and buy something. You know, I like to play golf, so maybe I'll go in and buy some golf equipment. I know how much I can spend. The value of that gift. But purity, what's the value of that holy and blame? You know, what does that get me? Why is it valuable? Well, the answer to that question is that it allows me to come into the presence of God without being ashamed, without being afraid, without feeling guilty. I mean, imagine if everything you ever thought and everything you ever did were revealed publicly, let's say, to this congregation. I don't know about you, but I'd be embarrassed. Remember, everything you've ever thought and everything you've ever done, we get up here, we show the video, then in 1972 she did this, and in 1979 she did, the, you know what I mean, she thought this just yesterday. I mean, at least you could say, well, you know, I'm not perfect and the rest of the congregation are not perfect, you know, and that might calm your discomfort. You know, who are you to judge me? You know what I'm saying? You probably thought things like that too. You, know, you could do that little game. But imagine coming before the perfect and holy God. That's a whole different story in this way. And so the first gift is the ability to come forward and be with God without embarrassment, without negative feelings of any kind. In other words, without feeling guilty, without feeling ashamed, because we have been purified. We have been made free from every sinful ble uh, blemish in our past lives, in our entire lives. So that's the first gift that God gives us on our spiritual birthday. Second gift is the gift of adoption. Paul continues to write, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Now, all people have been created by God, right? All people have been created by God. They are God's creatures, all people. But only those who are born again can say that God is their father. See the difference? Everybody can claim to have been created by God, but not everybody can claim that God is their father. God's plan was that those who would be Christians would become not his servants, but his sons and his daughters through adoption. And so remember we said, what's the gift here? Well, the gift here is that we have a relationship with God and one that gives us access to Him in an intimate way. You know, a person can have a large company and have a lot of people working for him, they see him as the boss, okay? And you know, maybe on friendly terms with him or her, but then all of a sudden, you know, the boss's son or daughter grows up and finishes school and so on and so forth and joins the company working for dad. Yeah, that, that person is an employee, but that person also has a special relationship with the boss because that's the boss's son or that's the boss's daughter. And those two people have a working relationship, but they also have an intimate relationship because of who they are, because this is the boss's child. And so as I said, not only can we come forward without embarrassment, but we can eagerly run forward and if you wish, jump into his lap, so to speak, as beloved sons and daughters of God. Romans chapter eight, verse 15. And so purity, Adoption, number three, grace. Again, Paul writes, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on 
us. Grace, the word grace means an unmerited favor. It means a lot of things, but unmerited favor I think is a, a, proper, uh, a proper definition. You, know, you receive something you don't deserve, that you didn't earn. God's grace refers to the merciful and kind way that God treats His children when they sin against Him or when they doubt Him. This is a most precious gift in that no good deed or amount of suffering we do has the power to force God to offer us grace. Nothing we do can force God to be merciful to us. We can't stand on our heads. We can't say 200 prayers in a row. We can't you know, serve the poor, uh, give our, you know, nothing we do can make Him offer us grace. He offers us grace because of what He is, not because of who we are. He gives his grace freely to his children. Why? Because he loves them, that's why. Now all people, all people receive God's grace in that they enjoy life and they enjoy the blessings of life here on earth to one degree or another. You know, there are plenty of people who don't believe in God, never mind they don't believe in Jesus Christ, who don't even believe in God, period. They're atheists, you know, forget about it, I don't believe in God. And yet those people find somebody to love, and many of them raise children and have a happy home and have successful careers. They eat good food. They, they have enjoyment. They love opera or they, they love sports and they, uh, the sunshine. They get a nice tan on the beach. They eat good food. They live to a long life. That's God's grace being bestowed on those people their entire lives on people who don't believe Him, in Him, or give thanks to Him. But God's children are special because not only do they enjoy God's grace here on earth, but they are also treated with grace and mercy at the judgment in the next world. You see, everyone else is dealt with according to the law. Romans chapter six, verse 23. All those who sin are lost. All those who sin and disobey God are condemned by God. Christians, however, are saved. Why? Because of their faith. They receive the grace of God. That promise of grace is received on your spiritual birthday. I tell people, you are no more saved 50 years after your baptism as on the day you were baptized. On the day you were baptized, you get a saved, you receive the grace that you're going to receive that you're going to need. Now you grow, you mature, you become more mature in Christ and more knowledgeable in all that business, but you're not any more saved 50 years after your day of baptism. On that day, you get as saved as you're ever going to be. Why? Because on that day, your spiritual birthday, God extends His grace to you. Number four, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Spiritual birthday gift. Imagine opening up a present and, and seeing forgiveness is your birthday gift. Paul says, in Him we have redemption, through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. Notice, you know, one of the things that kind of, not upsets me, but makes me, you know, gives me a feeling of angst, is when I hear people who have been Christians for a long, long time talk about their salvation as if they're hanging on by their fingernails. You know, how do you feel spiritually? Oh, not bad, I hope I make it. I hope I'm okay. And yet, you read this passage here, right? I read it again, I want you to see the adjectives that are used to describe 
what God is doing for us. It says, in Him we have redemption through His blood. That's, that's reference to the fact that Jesus Christ died to pay the moral debt for our sins, okay, through His blood. Right? And then he says, also what we receive, the forgiveness of our trespasses. It doesn't say a few of our trespasses or the small ones, it's just all of the trespass, all of the big ones, the little ones, and the ones in between, all right? Now here are the words, according to the riches of His grace. How rich do you think God is in grace? How deep is the well of God's goodness? You see the point I'm trying to make? Paul is saying God extends His forgiveness and His mercy towards you and I. At what rate? How does He do it? According to the depth of His goodness. According to the riches of His grace. How rich is He in grace? Unlimited. And then imagine, it says, of His grace, which He lavished on us. Not which He kind of sprinkled on us, you know, like you sprinkled just a little bit of pepper, you know, a, little, a little sprinkle. I'd be nervous if Paul would have said, of His grace, which He sprinkled on us. Oh man, you can, when you sprinkle, you can miss a spot. When I read this and it says lavished, it's like a bucket that's, you know, into the well and psh, he lavishes, he pours it on. He pours it on. In this sense, Paul explains how God provides this gift. He says through redemption. Jesus buys back, He redeems, He pays in full the price for all of our sins, and He does this by offering His perfect life to pay off the life we owe to God because of our sinfulness. And why? Jesus does it for us because no matter how hard we try, we never could do this for ourselves. So you're wondering how deep is the love? How much does He pour it on? To what degree is it? to the degree that He offers His own Son to pay the moral price for our sins. That's how much He loves us. Somebody who loves us that much, do you think He wants us to live a life of faith where we're just hanging on by our fingernails? Or do you think that He wants us to be living a life of confidence? I am confident in my salvation. I go to sleep at night with no worry of where my soul will, will go if my heart happens to stop beating in the, middle of the, in the middle of the night. We not only receive forgiveness at birth, but as His children, we know that our debt for sin is paid off in full, and it's paid off in full forever. We will sin again, but we will never owe for sin again. How's that for a deal? How's that for a blessing? So much, we just can't, we can't get our minds around it because we're not like that, are we? If you offend me, and I, you know, in my quote, graciousness, forgive you, but you offend me again, at some point I'm going to say, hey, enough, you know, it's enough. That's me, but that's not God. God forgives, God extends His mercy, God understands us according to His mercy and His grace, not according to ours. I don't know about you, sometimes I get fed up with one of you guys and you get fed up with me, but I'll tell you, I get fed up with me a lot more than I ever get fed up with you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I get tired of me and my shenanigans a lot more than I get tired of somebody else. Thanks be to God that God, His well of patience and love and mercy is so far deeper than whatever I could muster in that area of discipline. Forgiveness 
is a gift given at our spiritual birthday. Number five, knowledge, knowledge. Paul writes again, in all wisdom and insight he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. Now, natural learning is a long and painful process and it's without end and it's always needing change, right? You're always learning something new. No matter what you do, no matter what your discipline is in life, your job, your profession, there's always something new to learn. You, you keep on going. God's children, on the other hand, receive an insight of the complete design of all of God's purpose in creation and the history of mankind. We receive an insight not available through natural thinking, deductive thinking. God shows us something that we could not figure out for ourselves. God's children know the who, the why, and the what of God's plan for mankind. And Jesus Christ is the key to all spiritual knowledge, which is eternal knowledge. Once I know something from the scripture, I know it forever. <laughs> and it is true forever. It's interesting in Marty's lesson this morning, you know, people, false ideas, and so on and so forth. Something that the Bible declares as being false will always be false. Something that the Bible declares sinful will always be sinful. And something that, that the Bible declares God gives to us, we get to keep and always have forever. That's the beauty of Bible study. Once you know it, you possess it forever. You can build on it, you can see it you know, more deeply, but it never, it never changes. Paul says that God's ultimate plan for His creation is that it will all ultimately be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so by reading the Word of God through faith, we understand and we gain this insight into God's final plan, something that we could not figure out on our own, no matter how many books we read. What a wonderful gift to know the end of the story, to know the reason for it all, to know the goal towards which all events of human history are moving. You know, which way are we going? Where is the world heading? We know the answer. The world is heading to a point where at some point in the future, everything will be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's where we're heading. You can have all kinds of you know, prophets and prognosticators saying you know, what the future holds and new inventions and all that kind of stuff. And yes, you know, technically we may change. We may be, instead of cars, having kind of mini airplanes one day. I don't know. You, know, you may have drones delivering your stuff from Walmart. You know, yeah, that stuff changes. But that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that is the certainty of the future. And all those who before that time comes submit to Him have come into the eternal will of the Father. And that will never, never change. And this marvelous knowledge of the end, we would never know if God did not reveal it to us through Jesus Christ in His Word. It's a gift because we could have never figured it out on our own. He gives us this insight. He didn't have to. He didn't have to include these passages, but He gives us this insight as a gift. Number six, inheritance. 
Paul says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Some gifts are to be opened now, and some gifts are to be opened later. Paul says that through Christ, the children of God will inherit what has been originally set aside for them, an eternal life with God in heaven. The promise of heaven is a tangible gift even though it is and must remain wrapped until the return of Christ. You see what I'm saying? We got the gift, but we can't unwrap it yet. Now we can, you know, how you do with gifts under the Christmas tree, a couple of days ahead, your name's on it, and you, you, know, you shake it, what's in there? What's going on, what is it? Is it heavy, light? You know? we, can, we can shake and we can weigh this unopened gift to get some feel for what it might be like. You know, in our regular Christmas gifts, let's say, and we can do the same with this unopened gift here, this inheritance that we have that is wrapped up. So the Bible says certain things about it. Here, let me show you. It says, first of all, that we'll be like angels, intelligent, communicative, powerful, ethical. Luke 20, 36. The Bible says that that life, that inheritance, no death there, no sin, no illness. Revelation 7, 9 to 12. It also, the Bible also tells us that we will be together, the saints, the believers will be together and there will be fellowship. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18. The Bible says that we will experience joy and peace and love and wisdom and other emotions. Ephesians 1, 3. We will also be conscious of ourselves and other people say, you know, people ask me, you know, will we know who we are in heaven? I'm saying, well, why would it be heaven if I didn't know who I was? <laughs> well, you know, there's no heaven there. It's only heaven if I get there and go, yeah, so this is heaven. So I'll know who I am and I'll know who you are and you'll know who I am. And you'll say, you made it here too. You know. <laughs> The Bible also says that the, we will consciously be with God and Jesus. We will consciously be with Him. And it also says that we'll be doing something because in 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 2.12 it says that we will reign with God. What does that mean? You know what I, see what I'm saying? We, we have an idea, we're shaking that gift, that inheritance gift, and we're weighing it. We, we've got some ideas of what it'll be like, but we haven't been able to unwrap it yet. But one day, we'll be able to unwrap that gift and clearly see, experience, and know what it is. And then the seventh gift we receive at our rebirth is the Holy Spirit. It says, in Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, what's the message of truth? Well, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He died for you, and if you believe in Him and express that belief in repentance and baptism, you'll be saved. That's the truth, so He says, so uh, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now you see the gifts that we've talked about, they're divided into categories. The first two are gifts of new positions that we have before God. We're considered saints and we're considered as sons and daughters of God. The next two gifts are gifts of new attitude that God has towards us. He sees us with grace. He sees us as those who are forgiven. And then the last two are gifts of a new experience of God. We relate to Him now with knowledge and we will also relate to Him forever. 
unlike here, we relate to Him only temporarily. But the final gift that God gives is a person, not a thing. The Holy Spirit, who is God, is a gift in that He provides Christians with the power to enjoy and use all the other gifts that we have received. You see, without the Holy Spirit, all of the other gifts cannot be fully appreciated. Let me explain briefly. First of all, purity. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one that intercedes for the saints before God and keeps their way pure, Romans 8, 26. The second gift, adoption. It is through the Holy Spirit that the sons and daughters of God are able to cry out, Abba, Daddy, Romans 8, verse 15. The gift of grace. It is through the Holy Spirit that God manages the blessings of both the material world and the life as we know it as Christians in the kingdom. Genesis 1-2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. The gift of forgiveness. It was by the eternal spirit that Jesus offered himself as a redemptive sacrifice to obtain forgiveness. Hebrews 9.14. The gift of knowledge. It was through the direction of the Holy Spirit that men wrote down the revelation of God that gives us the wisdom and knowledge that we need in Christ. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 and 21. And finally, the gift of inheritance. It will be the Holy Spirit who will raise us up to dwell eternally with God in heaven when Jesus comes again. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. The gift of the Holy Spirit that you receive at your spiritual birth is your most precious gift because it is God Himself guaranteeing that all these other ones will actually work and they will work forever. What's interesting to note is that in John chapter one, the gospel writer explains the great miracle of the incarnation. God, a divine being, takes on a human body and nature in order to save man. And then when you go to Acts chapter two, Luke explains the exact opposite. The final purpose of the incarnation is that man will now be able to receive the indwelling of a divine being and take on a godly nature. So God takes on a human nature to save man so that man can then take on a divine nature and be like God. The perfect circle completed. So I ask you a question. Do you have a spiritual birthday? Have you been born again? If you have, realize that God has showered you with incredible gifts that are beyond earthly value or comparison. What, what, what do you think Jesus means when He says, what will you give in exchange for your soul? You know, he's referring to all the things that God has given you. What, what are you going to trade for that? So if you have realized that God has showered you with these marvelous gifts and they're beyond earthly value or comparison because your gifts come from heaven, not the mall, and your gifts are eternal. They never wear out, they never go out of style. And your gifts are safe. No one can take them away from you and your gifts are the same as every other child of God. Uh, uh, everyone receives the same gifts, so there's no need for jealousy or envy. You know, I think we just don't celebrate our spiritual birthday enough. So I want to teach you the Christian's birthday song that commemorates not your human birth, but your spiritual birth. I mean, it's sung to the tune of happy birthday, but the words are in your sermon notes. You know that, we've sung it. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. May God richly bless you. Happy birthday to you. I, I wish, I, I wish, I would hope that you would sing this song to your children when they have birthdays 
to begin preparing them for the day that they will receive the true, the true birthday gifts that come from heaven. If you could sing that song, remembering your own spiritual birth at baptism, these gifts are all yours and they're yours now and forevermore. So if you have not been born again, if you don't have the spiritual gifts, please know that you don't have to be left out of the party. These gifts can be yours as well and they can be yours today. We are going to sing another song tonight. This one is to invite you to the birthday party so you can share in the wonderful spiritual gifts that God has prepared, ready and is eager to give every single person who will come and be born again in the waters of baptism. If you need that, please come forward now as we stand and as we sit.